Well, good morning, friends. My name is John Woodhouse. If we haven't met, and the probability is that we haven't in a crowd like this, uh, it's lovely to be with you. And uh, my wife Moya and I uh, really want to express our, our very deep gratitude for the welcome we've received this last week and the uh, overwhelming hospitality and kindness we've experienced uh, from folk here at Parkside. We sort of consider ourselves kinder, kinder, that's Australian, kinder, kinder members of Parkside. We, um, we join you uh, most Monday evenings uh, way back home in Sydney. We began this habit during COVID lockdown and it's one of the one of the very few good outcomes of COVID, I think, <laughs> that we found ourselves uh, sharing with you uh, via the wonders of technology uh, on Monday evenings. And uh, I can't tell you what a thrill it is uh, to be here in person and to be sharing with you in this way. Please turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter five. I was tempted to go to 2 Samuel, but um, I thought with Alistair away, I'm sure you wouldn't tell him. <laughs> but Matthew chapter 5, please. And certainly it will be very helpful if you can uh, see the text of the Bible in front of you. And before I read, let's pray together. Jesus said of the very words we are about to hear this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that as we listen to the words of your Son, we would learn to be wise enough to build the house of our lives on the rock. We ask this in his name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, uh, reading from verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on a mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are difficult days. I think it's true to say we are all feeling the fragility of life as we have known it. We wonder, aware that we do not know what next week, next month, next year will bring. This morning I want to make uh, what might sound like the odd suggestion that at this time we could not do better than to give our attention this morning to these opening words of perhaps Jesus' most famous address, popularly known, of course, as the Sermon on the Mount. 
the whole address, which fills Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7, is about how human lives in reality can be built like a house built on the rock. Jesus explains this at the very end of the sermon. When the rain falls, when the floods come, when the wind blows, when the storms arise, when the troubles overwhelm us, when the conflicts tear us apart, when loss shatters us, the house is safe, solid, secure, unharmed, because it is built on the rock. Now think about it. Could life be like that? How? I wonder whether you feel, in, in all honesty, not just at a superficial level, that you're a bit happy and secure at the moment, things are going okay, but do you think that life is anything like that for you? Your life? A house built on the rock. We don't usually think like this, because of course we all have ideas about how good life could be. That's a different sort of question. And our minds go in directions quite different to what we're going to discover in Jesus' teaching. See, if you were able, what would you like to change about your life and your life situation? Most of us could answer that question. We've got ideas about how good life could be. See, I wonder if you're, you're the nostalgic type. When you get to my age, you get nostalgic and you look back to a time when you think life was as good as it gets. It's because you've forgotten all the bad things. Or are you a dreamer who's looking forward to some stage in life when the present pressures will be gone? And in your imagination, life will be good. Well, what did Jesus say about life at its very best? And I've given that, I've, I've, I've written, this is my heading for our study this morning, life at its very best. And we're coming to join the disciples on that mountain on that day to listen to the very first part of his teaching. Uh, and I wonder what were your first impressions as you listened again to those familiar words? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, and so on. Can I suggest to you that the best sign at this stage that we are really listening, that we're paying attention to the words of Jesus, that we're taking them seriously, would be to find ourselves responding something like this. What could he possibly mean? How could that be right? See, the most obvious puzzle is these opening, in these opening words is that word blessed. In the original languages of the Bible, there are a couple of words that get translated into English as blessed. This one means something like, oh, how fortunate. Oh, how privileged. It's a word that implies an exclamation mark. It means how very, very, it's a word you might like to use if you were describing life at its very best. You look around you and you think of people, think of people in the United States. Who do you think are the most privileged people, the most fortunate people? That's what this word means. That, 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 that those are the people you would apply this word to. And the puzzle is how Jesus joins this word to descriptions that sound the opposite, the opposite to fortunate and privileged. He seems to be saying, does he not, oh, how fortunate are those who are down in the dumps. Oh, how privileged are those who are sad. How envi enviable, I should say, how enviable are the powerless and the persecuted. Is he, is he suggesting that if you're not poor in spirit, mourning or meek or persecuted, you really are missing out on life at its best. 
Let's see if we can help you get a little bit more miserable. <laughs> now that can't be right, can it? So what I'd like to do this morning, and for much of our time we'll be doing this, it's a little unusual, we're not looking at the text in detail, the one before us, uh, but we're going to step back and see if the context of the Sermon on the Mount sheds some light on those opening words and indeed on the rest of what Jesus said that day on the mountain. So context. I wonder if you turn back with me to just a couple of pages to Matthew chapter 1, the very first page of the New Testament. And there are two key points here that I believe will help us. First, look with me at Matthew's very first sentence, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, where he tells us that if you're going to understand the story that Matthew has to tell about Jesus Christ, you've got to go back to whom? Look at it, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham. Well, those of us who are Bible readers, we know who Abraham was. Abraham was the man who long, long, long before Jesus, way back in the very first book of the whole Bible, Abraham heard God's great promise, the promise that really is the theme of the Bible. God said to Abraham, here's some homework. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 12. I'd encourage you to go back and read Genesis chapter 12, the first few verses, and then read the verses in Matthew 5 that we're looking at. Matthew, in Genesis 12, the promise came to him in, in words like these. God said to Abraham, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. Through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Anything interesting there? Could there be a connection between God's promise to Abraham, bless, blessing, blessed, and Jesus' words on the mountainside, blessed, blessed? Now, for those who are experts in these things, I need to acknowledge that it's a little clearer in English than it is in the original, but it's, a ne it's nevertheless clear. In other words, the word blessed in each case in the original is not the same word, you understand. But in English, it comes out quite striking that you have blessed, 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 blessed. Uh, but I think that the connection that you see in English is nevertheless valid, but we won't go into technicalities here. So that's the first ray of light. and I'll, We'll see how it helps us in a few moments. A second ray of light from Matthew chapter 1. Matthew gives us, you'll be familiar with this if you've ever been uh, asked to teach the Bible and you're, you wouldn't want to be given Matthew chapter 1, really, would you? At least not the first part. For what happens is that Matthew introduces his story in the most remarkable way by giving a kind of sketch of history down the centuries from Abraham to Jesus. He, he puts it in the form of a genealogy or a family tree. And the idea is that this long, long history, it's a history of about 2,000 years. It's the history that the whole Old Testament records in some detail. That history is the background that makes sense of Jesus Christ. That long history has been leading up to him. And you notice how Matthew then sums this up in verse 17, Matthew 1 verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. In other words, the immediate historical background to Jesus Christ is what Matthew calls here the deportation of the Jewish people to Babylon. Now bear with me. This event is rather less well known even to Bible readers than Abraham, but it's very important. Very important for understanding Jesus, and indeed I would say very important for understanding our world. Let me try to explain. The exile, as this deportation is often called, and its aftermath, is really the situation with which the Old Testament ends. In the year 
uh, about 587 BC, the Old Testament people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, you understand, lost their land, they lost their king, they lost their temple, they lost their freedom, many lost their lives. They lost, in other words, the Old Testament blessings that God had given the descendants of Abraham, whom God had promised to bless. And these days of the exile were the darkest of days, for it was, in fact, God's judgment on the Old Testament people of Israel for their foolish, corrupt rejection of God. We get a sense for how dark these days were by reading passages like Psalm 137 or the Book of Lamentations. And even though towards the end of the Old Testament story, some people returned to the, to the land, there was, a, there was an attempt to rebuild the temple. Nevertheless, the prophets were around saying, this isn't it, the, the, the exile is still on. We're still in exile. And the thing about the exile, the dire situation of the Jewish people at the end of the Old Testament, is that their troubles are a kind of small-scale version of the state of the whole world. There is a profound sense in which the people of our world, our whole world, are living in darkness, like the people of Israel at the end of the Old Testament. Now, at different periods in history, this may be more obvious than others. I think that we are living in a time when it is more obvious than it has been for a long time that our world is in darkness. These are dark days for the whole world, but for deeper reasons than the fractured politics and the divided society and the fragile economy and whatever else you might like to name. We might see it more clearly today, but the reality we see has been with us for a long time. We are experiencing in our world the judgment of God on the whole world for its foolish, corrupt rejection of God. Those are the deep troubles of which the things we feel, the things we're aware of, the things we hear on the news and so on are merely symptoms. The deep troubles of our world are not new. Now, one of the interesting things, you say, you're going to get back to the passage you're supposed to be expanding. We'll get there. We will, I promise. Come with me. Because one of the interesting things as you read the Psalms and the prophets and other Old Testament books about the people of Israel in those dark days of the exile, some of the phrases that are used to describe them are a bit like this. The poor, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for things to be put right. Life was not good in the exile. And again, friends, you see, I want us just to see this, this parallel because it, it helps us to understand the world in which we live, which is such a confusing world, particularly these days. But this helps to see our world. You see, the exile is like our world. There is so much sadness. It's overwhelming at times. It's easy to pretend that it's not. But we're pretending, we, we're very much aware when we surround ourselves with comforts and we cushion ourselves from the suffering that surrounds us in this world. Who's living in the real world? Those who are suffering or those who have managed to cushion themselves from it? There is so much, so much in our world that is simply not good. And of course the reality is, the reality that we, we really don't like facing up to, but the reality is that the shadow of death hangs over us all. How we long for things to be better, don't we? Of course we do. You see, look at the people of Israel in exile and we see a picture of ourselves, our broken world, our sad world, our world in which so much is not right our world which is so dark. Through those Old Testament dark days, there were prophets. 
like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, who kept on saying, they kept beating the same drum, they kept on saying that the exile, terrible as it is, do not imagine that it is the end. God has not finished. God will yet bring light into the darkness. God will bring healing to those who are suffering, comfort to those who are sad. God has not forgotten his promise to Abraham. The exile will come to an end and the promised blessing will come. And when it comes, there will be blessing for the world. All right, one more thing from the context. It would be lovely if we got to the text, wouldn't it, eh? This is a, a sermon on the context. You don't want to do this every week, but maybe we can get away with it one week, particularly if you've got someone from Australia. <laughs> one more thing from the context, a little bit closer this time to Matthew chapter 5. I want to ask the question, what was Jesus doing when he gathered his disciples on the mountain for the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, the Sermon on the Mount must be one of the most misunderstood pieces. Have you ever met somebody who said, um, oh, I don't believe in God, I just believe in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, I don't believe in God, I just uh, believe the Ten Commandments. Uh, then you've met a person who's read neither, and certainly has, who has understood neither. Well, what was Jesus doing as he went up on the mountain? His disciples came to him, his disciples, a bigger group than the twelve, but th those who were, were coming to Jesus and being responsive to him, they came to him and he began teaching them. What was he doing? Look back with me at chapter 4, just before this teaching and verse 23 Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people the gospel of the kingdom the gospel of the kingdom is the news of God's kingdom God's rule the news of the coming of what God had promised to Abraham. The end of the exile, just as the prophets had said. The gospel of the kingdom was the announcement of a new day, a new era in which a great light will shine into the darkness. Wrongs will be put right. The goodness of God will prevail, in a word, a time of blessing. Now Jesus accompanied, you notice in verse 23 there, his proclamation that this new era had dawned with a demonstration as he healed every disease and sickness that he came across. The kingdom of God was in their midst. And so, as Jesus went up on that mountain, sat down, and his disciples gathered around him, he began to teach them what this gospel, what this good news means. That is, what is the kingdom of God? What does it mean that the kingdom of God has arrived? That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. It's Jesus teaching what his message means. And it began with the words that are before us this morning, to which we at last come. Poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who long for things to be put right. That's what righteousness essentially means, longs for things to be put right. That was Jesus' way of describing those who were listening to him, living in exile, so to speak. He was taking words and expressions from the Old Testament time of exile. And friends, I want us to grasp this, that they are Jesus' way of describing those who are listening to his words today. Our broken lives, our sadnesses, our weakness, our longing, our sense of darkness, this broken 
crumbling world. He's not necessarily describing how we feel. He's describing how we are. Well, now let's return to these words and listen a little more carefully. And the first thing I'd like us to notice is that the gospel of the kingdom, the message of Jesus Christ, is an announcement of blessing for people like us. It really is good news. Exile is not a good place to be. For the disciples of Jesus on that mountain that day or for us, in an analogous situation in our world, in darkness, in pain, in sorrow, poor in spirit, so to speak, too many reasons to mourn, not powerful enough to change things for the better, hungering and thirsting for things to be put right. Jesus is describing us, isn't he? But his message is that such people, people like us, are very fortunate indeed because, he said, things are about to change. Sometimes, friends, uh, I think that these words at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 have been understood in a way that seems to me to be back the front. Well, that's what you would say. You're an Australian. You're upside down. But you, <laughs> bear with me. As though Jesus was saying, uh, I wonder if you've heard uh, these words uh, sort of thought about in this way, as though Jesus was saying, if you're poor in spirit enough, if you're sad enough, if you're hungering and thirsting enough, then you'll be blessed as a kind of conditional reward for being miserable enough. Now, I'm caricaturing a little, of course. But in our passage this morning, one of the most striking things, I think, is that there are only two imperatives. And they are not be poor, be sad. The imperatives come in, birth, they're both of them in verse 12. Do you notice them? Rejoice and be glad. And I don't think that we've heard Jesus' words rightly unless they lead us to rejoice and be glad. Because the message of Jesus is an announcement of blessing for people like us. Now, a second thing for us to grasp is that the gospel of the kingdom, the message of Jesus Christ, is a promise to people like us. You see, it's the last part of each of these wonderful sentences that shows us why we should be rejoicing and glad. Look with me at verse 3. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's repeated down in verse 10. For theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. And then in verses 4 to 9, he fills out what that means. What does it mean to belong to the kingdom of heaven? Well, they shall be comforted. They shall inherit the earth. And verse 6, they shall be satisfied. Verse 7, they shall receive mercy. Verse 8, they shall see God. Verse 9, they shall be called sons of God. The good news of the kingdom is the promise of God's blessing. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He is saying the kingdom of heaven the wonderful rule of God over human lives is at hand. And life doesn't get better than that. Well, now we can notice how there is a kind of progression through the descriptions of those who are so fortunate. So far, I focused on verses 3 to 6, but in verse 7, we have blessed are the merciful. Then verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. And verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now again, these are not conditions to be met in order to receive the blessing of which Jesus is speaking. They are the effects of the blessing. These are aspects of the promised blessing. Jesus is describing one group of people. The people living in darkness to whom the light of the good news of the kingdom has come. In other words, he is describing us. One final thing that deserves more time than I have allowed. 
The gospel of the kingdom which, of which Jesus is speaking in here is about the king. See, Jesus Christ is the one who had been promised by the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah in particular, sent to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn. That Old Testament scripture, it was being fulfilled in the hearing of the disciples on that mountainside as Jesus spoke these words. Now this, of course, is why the gospel of the kingdom is an announcement of blessing, why it is such a promise, because Jesus Christ is the king in God's kingdom. He is the one who brings and will bring all that is here promised. And that is why he says to those who come to him, as the disciples came to him then, as we may come to him today. Verse 11, blessed are you. Blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. It seems to me that all of that has become clearer in our day than it had been earlier. It was real earlier, but it's got a sharpness about it today. And what does Jesus say to us? Verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How good could life be? The things that naturally come to our minds in response to that question are feeble. How good could life be? Well, dear, it'd be good if I was well and healthy. How good could life be? Oh, it'd be good if I was secure in work. How good could life be? How good it would be if I was prosperous and able to do what I wanted to do. What happens to those understandings of the, good, of the good life once we've heard the words of Jesus? Life does not get better than this. Belonging to the kingdom of heaven. How about that? Knowing the comfort that only God can give. Inheriting the earth. I actually can't understand what that means. But whatever it means, it sounds pretty grand, doesn't it? Being satisfied, satisfied by the way in which God will put all things, all things right. It's experiencing God's mercy, being God's children, looking forward to the day when we will see him. That is as good as it gets. Oh, we can and surely we should be doing what we can to make the world safer and kinder and better, but let's not be deluded. The best efforts of the best people will be feeble and sometimes they will only make things worse. The hope of the world, the hope of our world is the one who spoke these words on a mountain in Galilee some 2,000 years ago. He is God's king, and he has begun the work of putting things right. Oh, how fortunate are those who come to him and listen to him. They are building a house on the rock. Now this evening we're going to take this a little further as we listen to what Jesus said next, but let's pray together now. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we have heard the words of Jesus. We have heard this wonderful announcement that even people like us 
Yeah, with our broken lives, with our feeble lives, for whatever we pretend to be, with our weakness and our poverty and our sadnesses. We are so fortunate, for Jesus has come and he has brought the blessings of the kingdom to us. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and all he has done. In his name, amen.